Thank you, Greg. I've got um, a microphone on, but it's not for the loudspeakers, it's for the recording. Um, so if you do pose questions, uh, I need to repeat your question just for the benefit of the recording. Uh, I'm Malcolm Mousseau, as Greg said, and I've been asked to talk about uh, match management, player and coach management. Am I speaking loudly enough? Can you hear me, Scott? Mm, good. Wonderful. Um, so uh, I don't know if I will take the full 45 minutes. We'll see how it goes, but I won't go over 45 minutes, that's for sure. And um, I've been asked to talk about this, and I'm going to break it down. I'm going to start with a little story, and then I'll come back to and the rest of the story at the very end. Um, there'll be an introduction, talk about procedures, and then talk about the specific act of managing certain challenging behaviors. Um, in 2015, uh, I did my last, I refereed my last uh, international match in South Korea at Fishu Games. And it was the gold medal match. I was R2 um, men's match between Russia and Ukraine. And in 2014, Russia had invaded uh, a large Ukrainian territory called the Crimean, Crimean Peninsula. Question already? No. Oh, okay. Um, and I and in that match, early in the third set, the um, Ukrainian passer shanks the ball. The ball goes outside the antenna, behind the first referee, and so the front left side player from Ukraine runs after the ball. At the same time, the back row player from Russia is running towards the same ball for no logical reason and starts shouting at him in Russian. And all of a sudden, the Ukrainian team get really upset and all of a sudden there are five Ukrainian players at the net shouting at the Russian players at the net. So they must have heard what he said to him. Afterwards, somebody said, he might have said something to the effect that we, you lost the war, now you're going to lose this match. Anyhow, so that's the situation. Can you picture that? Okay, what would you do as R1? I just want you to pose yourself that question. Think about it. We'll get back to it a little later. Um, so that was exciting and it was uh, caused from some very interesting discussions afterwards. I don't have all the answers regarding match management. Um, I'm here to share with you a couple of stories, uh, some advice that I've picked up along the way. Uh, some of you who have heard me speak, I think I was, I was in January speaking to some Alberta referees and uh, you've probably heard some of these uh, before. Uh, but what's important as we keep going, because I've refereed for a number of years, but just a few weeks ago I was corrected at a national clinic uh, because uh, Don Middleton and I did a, a match at MRU here, and then uh, the national clinic candidates uh, were um, briefing us, giving us feedback on our match. And what came out of that was uh, one of the candidates said, you know, why are you doing this when you're an R2, Malcolm? And I, I started thinking about that. And then at the end of it all, I said, you know what? You're right. That's an old habit. I need to. So I'm working on changing this habit as an R2 that I've been doing, doing for 70, for, for 70, for several years. Yeah, sometimes it feels like it. But um, the whole idea is you always have to work on being current and you, sometimes you think you're current but you're not and so everybody deserves and needs feedback to go forward. Um, so maybe through this, you know, sharing with everyone, everybody can come away with one thing that just might prompt them to shift in, in one aspect of refereeing or just being as an individual. It is easier to talk about it than to actually do it, to make the decision in the situation. That's for sure. 
here are some ideas uh, that I've picked up from credible, credible sources. My mantras regarding refereeing are, and it starts with advice from my dad when I first started refereeing, he said, just be ready for anything. Uh, Don Pfeiffer said many years ago, uh, we provide a service. So we're not running the show. We're not controlling everybody. We're providing a service. Uh, Guy Bradbury, uh, many of you have heard him say before, three ingredients to success, preparation, skill, and luck. Um, and uh, Pierre Farmer from Quebec uh, once told me uh, before going into a, what I considered a big match, just remember, uh, be friendly and firm at the same time. So those, for me, resonate and they work for me. Match management. Why? Why is it important? I think it's important um, because the goal of good refereeing is to promote spectacular volleyball plays in order to keep the ball flying. It's that simple. Um, it's not easy to do, but that's the goal. And no attention is paid to the officials. So we've heard this before. You come off the stand, people don't remember who the referee was, but boy, that was a great match. Then you did a good job. I'm going to ask you a question to uh, reflect on for 10 seconds. You come away from a match, a spectator says... The referee lost control of the match. What do you think might have happened? So think about that for 10 seconds. Now speak to somebody beside you and share your answer with them. See if you come up with the same few ideas. Okay, how many people said inconsistent ball handling calls? All right. How many people said insufficient sanctioning of the players and the coaches? That's another big one, eh? How many said improper application of the sanction scale? Nobody. One. Anything else? That's it? Okay. This, uh, this is about the security blanket. Um, before approaching the gym, you need to do a bit of preparation at home, and that is to update yourself on the rules that will govern the next match that you're going into. As you know, Different levels have different rules and different conferences have different rules. Um, and I would say for this topic, know the sanctions scale chart. It's a table. And I had attended several tournaments overseas where that was a test question. You get off the plane, you arrive, there's a meeting, you have to write a test. And uh, at several tournaments, that was a question on the test draw and fill in the table of sanctions. And so that's, for this topic, what you would prepare in terms of before approaching your match. Uh, the concept of security blanket came to me when um, 
many years ago, I um, I had interviewed, you know, I guess in 88, interviewed Weezer Bridal because I was ROC of Ontario and I felt Ontario uh, needed to work on their skills as second referees. And um, so Weezer said, well, here's the concept of the security blanket. And, and then we discussed a little bit more and it was really valuable. Um, a few, th a few things. Leave your ego at the gym door. Because the next match is bigger than you. You're not running the show. You're facilitating a really good show. You're facilitating a really good athletic competition. And you want to make sure there are no unfair advantages. So Weezer said complications can be avoided if you've prepared your security blanket before the match. Be seen executing your pre-match checklist. You're verifying the equipment, you're counting the chairs, you're checking the balls and the measurement of the net. And part of it is to check, but part of it is to instill confidence on whoever is checking you out before the match begins. Know exactly where the penalty area is in this gym. Check biases. And how do you do that? Well, one is be seen giving equal time chatting with both coaches. So if you walk over to one coach, big hug, long talk, and just shake hands, hi, have a good match, the perception is really not very professional and doesn't, doesn't seem like it's going to be a fair outcome. Um, R1, communicate your expectations with R2 and with all the referee assistants. R2, check with the score, etc. Um, R1 and R2 on this particular topic, go over what is the signal if the R2 wants R1 to give a card. You know, is it this? Something needs to happen? Is it, you know, this is what I like? You know, it's uh, so as long as the both of you know exactly what that signal is going to be, uh, then that helps with the security blanket. During the match, uh, first referee, use your line judges. So be a team. Use your line judges with every whistle. Check on the R2 prior to every service authorization. If there is a, what might be a sticky call, R1, conference, bring the R2, bring one or two relevant line judges. What that does is it buys time and it decreases doubt. And then you make up your mind. R2, know your responsibilities. Know when the coach may or may not ask that question because there are things the coach can ask about and there are things the coach cannot ask about um, so that's important when the coach is upset at the r1 and is walking towards the sideline and is about to there's a little non-verbal r2 support strategy and that would be you walk towards the coach and you just sort of, you don't have to say anything, but what you're doing is you're acknowledging that they're really frustrated. So you're opening up the communication channels. That helps. Coach needs to feel that at least they're hearing me. Um, and sometimes the R2 will say, you know, nonverbal, uh, but just staying at the post and not acknowledging that this communication is going on is not going to help matters. R2 during intervals and interruptions. It looks like you're not doing much, but you're really, I mean, things can go off track quickly. So make sure you get the right communication from uh, the score. Make sure you've checked in with the R1 visually. Uh, be predictable. Be in the right place at the right time. During intervals, for example, um, I've seen 
uh, a partner, uh, R2, and when I was in R1 in a match, in between sets, walk over to the team huddle, take a step in. I really need your lineup card. And then the coach erupts. And um, because he didn't have full control of the English language, he says, stop hustling me. But really, he meant hassling. Um, that wasn't necessary. And so as R2, between sets go, stand beside the coach's chair. They know you're there. Don't walk into their team huddle. There's an intensity there that you don't need to be a part of. Uh, but show that you're there. Show you're there for a reason. Be predictable. Same time, same position. Um, and you've communicated that. And that's good enough. R2, be quick to recognize when there's an improper request and manage it properly. R2, during game interruptions, anticipate and handle efficiently requests. I remember a few weeks ago, I was late catching a player running up for a substitution and I was not in the right position and all of a sudden there was another request behind and I realized, okay, th there might be a mess happening here so I needed to non-verbally manage it properly or with my whistle say, T -t just wait, these guys first. Um, so that's just being alert. And after the match, procedurally, before coming down from the stand, Oh, wait a second. Yep. Yeah. Uh, nope, not there yet. So before coming down from the stand, uh, R1, take your cards, because you might have to use them at the score table. Because you might have to quickly blow your whistle and show a card if people are wondering what's happening before the score sheet is signed. So there's always that possibility. Um, and after the match, procedurally, um, R1, R2, referee assistants, have a debrief away from the court. Great learning opportunity before everybody forgets the little things that happened during the match. Okay, misbehavior management. Um, Dennis Pomeroy from Saskatchewan once told me there are two games that are played during a match. One is for the team to win the point, and two is for the team to influence the referee to get some calls going their way. Um, and so always be aware of both. But so what that means is, um, every once in a while you make the wrong decision and you feel, oh, you don't feel great about it. So your responsibility is to reset your counters at zero and be ready for the next play. Because if you are going flashing back to that bad situation or indecision, then you're not present in, while the next play is happening. So what I'm saying is if you made a bad call, and there is misbehavior going on. Yes, there is a little bit of venting. But you can't let them vent too much to lose control of the match. You will continue to try to make the right call. But opening yourself with a bad decision does not give them license to just continue to misbehave. So two games being played all the time. When the captain approaches you and has a question with this body language, don't shoo them away because the rule book says they have the right to pose a question. You need to give them an answer. Now, depending on what the question is, that's when you decide, I've given you an answer to this question. Um, Next time, it'll be a card, okay? So that's important because the rule says 
the, the captain is authorized to speak to the referees to ask for an explanation on the application and interpretation of the rules, also to submit questions of his or her teammates. So they have a right to do this. Bonjour, André. Uh, before you apply the sanction scale, we're getting into red cards. Know the score. Know the score in the set. When in a set would this habit be helpful? Knowing the score. Just by the looks on your faces, I think you know what I'm talking about. So, um, linked to that, before I get into the next little experience that I had, um, the other piece of advice is the R1, protect your team. Protect the R2, protect your line judges. Um, I think it was in 2001, um, I was an international referee candidate. So I had the uniform, but no, no patch. Um, and I was doing in Toronto a, an exhibition match between uh, Argentina and Canada. And Stelio de Rocco was the head coach. Um, in set two, the Argentinian setter walks towards line judge three and says something pretty insulting in Spanish. Just so happens line judge uh, R2 and line judge 3 spoke the language. And so R2 walked over to me and said, essentially, this is what he said to the line judge because he didn't, didn't agree with his call. And so called over the player on the court, uh, showed a yellow card. And then a little bit later on in set 2, the score was 22-23. Canada had 23. And the setter walked over to the same line judge and did the same thing. So I, anyhow, everybody can interpret, you know, what's his game, what's... Um, so I gave a, a red card and I gave Canada point twenty four, And Canada then in the next rally, won the next point, won that set. And then the interval between sets, the team interpreter from Argentina, as he was on his way to the washroom, stops by the referee stand and says, you know, one more bullshit call like that and we're walking out. And then went to the washroom and came back. And, and I said, I think you need to go back. <laughs> and... So that's what happened. Canada went on to win the match. I think it was four set in four sets. Um, and in those situations, when things are happening rather quickly and your interpretation of everybody's perspective on that situation, um, you know, you're, you, you have worked on keeping this really calm, but this is happening also, you know, while, while you're on the stand and, so after the match, the debrief conversations were interesting, but one piece of feedback was interesting was, you know, the, the Canadian coach came over and he said, uh, good for you not to let them walk all over you, was what he had said. And then we debriefed with the line judges and the R2 to went over, okay, what exactly did he say? And, you know, we were satisfied with um, the sanctions in that situation. There was no uh, jury on the match. Um, so I don't know what the evaluation would have shown, but there you go. Um, another thing, um, Peter Henry from Manitoba once told me something about eyebrows. And he says, in a match, you're looking at our two um, type play to the net, and if you raise your eyebrows, it means help. I need some information here. But if you're sanctioning a player and you do this, the, the nonverbal communication is not, it, it doesn't instill a whole lot of confidence. 
So that's something I've kept in mind is, is I keep my eyebrows down if I have to do this kind of business in terms of sanctioning because you need the, to be the one that's level-headed. Yep, Curtis. In the story that I was told, was there a repercussion on what the interpreter told me uh, during the match? No, there was no. It's it's a different situation when it's an exhibition match. Um, there isn't a jury. There isn't as much um, as many officials from different levels. So, yeah. Um, in a situation where you need to intervene and modify the behavior, um, slow things down. Take your time. Because whatever decision is made needs to be done non-verbally and clearly communicated to the whole gym. So you take your time. Depending on the situation, you bring the captain over or you bring the player over on the court. You use the language of the rule book as much as possible, make it brief, and then you make it clear to everybody who is receiving and away we go. So, R1, in the case of misconduct, before the minor misconduct stage one, there's lots of things you can do to... Um, avert people from heading towards the sanction zone. Um, the FIVB ref guidelines say you use your personality. Um, I think what that means is a lot of nonverbal, sometimes a little bit of whistles, toot toot, you know, and a little bit of a hand signal. This is the line or that's enough. Um, but one thing I've that's become important to me in the last probably 10 years is the word communication acknowledge that they are frustrated. Um, you don't have to sympathize, but you need to acknowledge, okay, I, you know, you want to let me know you're not happy, got it, and then that's enough. Minor misconduct stage two, yellow card. So you handle the misbehaviors appropriately and efficiently. If you want to give a card to the player on the court, you don't bring over the captain, you bring over the player on the court. Little things like that. If you want to give a yellow card to a player on the bench, you bring the captain over and say, when you go over towards the bench, you tell number 13 to please raise his hand. So timing, and deliberate and slow. He's getting a yellow card, four. He's walking over you're hoping that he raises his hand, and as he is talking to him, maybe a quick blast of your whistle, Tritt! your attention is on you, and all of a sudden, this is why. Now you're showing everybody what's happening right now while they're talking. So timing helps with that communication. Um, personally, uh, the message is being transmitted, and if the player is not automatically, or the coach raising his hand, but you feel there's some sort of acknowledgement, I won't go to the wall and sanction more because they will refuse to raise their hand. I think it has been managed, it's been communicated. Um, there are times to do a little bit of give and take because that's being empathetic towards how they must be feeling right now. But the match must go on, let's, let's keep things moving. Remember the new rule uh, from September 2018, Volleyball Canada, which says any direct unsportsmanlike conduct, uh, uh, yes, from team members on the bench towards the referees, so across the court, will automatically result in stage two misconduct warning or more depending. So this is an adjustment that I've, been working on as well in the last few years. Don't know if you know this guy. Um, 
So rude conduct, contrary to good manners or moral principles, sometimes it might be better to expel than to award a penalty point. Sometimes, not that many off, many times, but if it's match point, this guy's already received a yellow card. Are you going to be the person to end the match with a red card? Or is it better in that time to expel him and let the players decide? I'm just leaving it out there. And then we move on to, and then offensive conduct, aggressive conduct. And yes, it's it's not that clear what's offensive and what's aggressive, um, depending on the situation. And you have to be there. You have to hear these specific words. Uh, Bill was saying something that uh, that he had seen not too long ago. And yeah, uh, some words are they aggressive? Because the, I think the rule book says needs to be. Um, a verbal threat of physicality or a physical aggression. And so sometimes there are gray zones and you sort of have to be there and, and see the leading up to that situation. Um, and it's not easy. It doesn't happen that often and it's not easy, but it's one of those, be ready for anything. Uh, don't be blindsided, be aware of all all the players are two in these types of situations I talked about stepping towards an emotional coach who really wants a direct line of communication with the R1 uh, because the body language can communicate a couple of things I acknowledge you are frustrated and please calm down um, when necessary, R2 can request uh, a sanction. And once again, that's where it's important to have had that discussion previous on what is the signal. And, you know, making sure that the two of you are on the same, are on the same line. Yes, if there's a request and the R1 really doesn't think it's necessary, uh, then the R1 can decide, you know, I acknowledge how the R2 feels, but you better be sure that you have all the information. And if you don't, bring them over and say, well, okay, well, you know, I'm not sure this warrants it. What exactly is going on over there? Um, so that helps slow things down before you make an important decision. Uh, and very important uh, to avoid protests, then after the sanction, the R2 makes sure things are properly recorded on the score sheet. So this is, I don't know if it's fair, but it's, it's an example of maybe in a heated situation, the presence of an R2 who is predictable, right place, right time, body language is business-like, calm, um, I don't know if I should comment on eyebrows up or down, but looks like it's very calm and composed, even though there might be a lot of chaos going on around. So that helps uh, keep everybody's focus, not on the coach, not on the outbursts, but on the spectacular play, because that's the goal, not on the referees. So the rest of the story, uh, back to that final in South Korea when there were five Ukrainian players at the net yet shouting at a couple of Russian players at the net on the other side. And, you know, things are not always textbook. What is it that happened? A little bit anticlimactic because the R1 called over the captains. And asked me to come over, maybe to make sure, you know, his use of the English language was appropriate. And he said, please, oh, he says, why fighting? 
please play the game. That's all he said. And they did. And it just... And they played. And the match resumed. And I was surprised. And, and I think it's because he had built trust in them. He had, throughout the match, been consistent, fair, aware. Perhaps they had seen him throughout this two, three-week tournament. And the, there was some sort of uh, trust. So that's what happened. After the match, in a debrief with the jury members, it was suggested that much earlier a yellow card should have been given at the first sign of any kind of trouble before everything came up at the net. Um, that was the, the feedback in our evaluation afterwards. So that's, it's interesting. Yeah, I think one of the messages is, you know, you just be predictable, open, keep communication channels open and in control. And there will be that sort of trust eventually that you must earn um, that will arrive at a situation where coming out with a lot of sanctions might just might not be necessary. So that's one of the takeaways that I had from that situation. In the end, if you want to improve, be prepared, know the rules, read the referee guidelines. They are updated and the first part of it is what's new in this version the FAQ document, the case book, be ready for anything, which to me means, you know, try to be fit and be well rested. Be predictable, keep the ball flying, and debrief after your matches. Questions? Yeah, Curtis. Russia. That's me. <laughs> uh better mute that. <laughs> and they shook hands. There we go. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Thanks for inviting me. It's always great to share stories with uh, fellow referees. And uh, have a good day.